Hello, my friends. I'm delighted to share with you the new book that's coming out uh, end of this year, but you can pre-order it right now. And it's called Quantum Body. And it's about the new science of living a longer, healthier, and more vital life, Quantum Body. And my two co-authors are Jack Tuzinski, who's a professor of quantum physics, and Brian Fertig, who, like me, is an endocrinologist and a specialist in endocrinology and metabolism. And so, very delighted to share with you Quantum Body and why we wrote this book. So, uh, before I share a little bit about quantum consciousness, quantum mind, quantum body, quantum universe. Uh, I also uh, would like to say that uh, this book uh, will probably be very appealing to lay people and also to those who are interested in quantum consciousness. Um, but uh, there are many mainstream scientists who will be annoyed by this book, and they have been annoyed by my previous book, uh, Quantum Healing. And mainstream science, uh, and many scientists in mainstream, they roll up their eyes when we speak about quantum consciousness, or when we speak about, um, uh, you know, quantum mind, or quantum body, or quantum healing. Uh, a lot of them roll their eyes up because they think that is infringing on their territory and non-physicists uh, have no business, business talking about uh, quantum mechanics and especially um, the quantum mysticism, as they call it, when we refer to quantum mind, quantum body, or quantum universe. So... Uh, here is uh, why we think, um, including my co-authors, physicists and biologists, why we think that actually uh, the quantum model for mind and body is probably the best model. Number one, the ground state of all existence is the superposition of possibilities. That everyone agrees. Right, quantum mechanics says that the ground state um, could be something called the quantum vacuum, where um, there are uh, basically uh, virtual particles that are appearing in and out, uh, temporary appearance of virtual particles as the as determined by the uncertainty principle, and that's exactly how consciousness operates. Your thoughts are clouds of entangled possibilities before one of them manifests as determined by the uncertainty principle, which is past experience or what I call karma. So the body functions because of memory and that memory, this body is the place that our memories call home for the time being. And these memories exist as possibilities till they're actualized. Otherwise, they remain unmanifest. Just like uh, all the uh, particles remain entangled as possibilities till one manifests upon measurement. Secondly, all our perceptual activities, all our sensations, all our images, all our feelings, all our thoughts are actually qualia that exist in entanglement, just like all particles exist in entanglement. So as soon as I say, let's say I say the word mother, that's a thought, but then it's also an emotion. It could also be an image in your consciousness, a feeling and a whole story that emerges as soon as that one word is uttered. So all your sensations, images, feelings, thoughts, are qualities of awareness, which are actually quantum because they are qualia. They appear and disappear, just like particles. 
And so also when we look at studies like synesthesia, we can see there's overlap of senses and all the senses are sensory information is quantum in nature. The appearance of thoughts, sensations, perceptions, feelings follows uh, some kind of intentionality, some kind of desire to measure and experience. And as I said, that is determined by the uncertainty principle, much like Schrodinger's wave equation. And then also modes of knowing on human observation determine what we will see. Is this a wave? Is this a particle? You do a wave-like experiment, you get a wave-like answer. Do a particle-like experiment, you get a particle-like answer. And before the, that, they are both the same. So Schrodinger's equation is actually describing the statistical likelihood of space-time events in consciousness uh, upon um, either a conscious intention or unconscious intention. So furthermore, all quantum fluctuations occur as space-time events in our consciousness as sift sensations, images, feelings, thoughts. So mind is quantum, consciousness is quantum. And the body that we experience, the physical body, the changing physical body that we experience is also a continuum of sensations, images, feelings, and thoughts, and therefore quantum in nature. Now, if you think uh, this is reasonable, then you will see that uh, actually uh, our whole scientific worldview needs to be revised. The current scientific worldview is reductionist. Large problems are divided into smaller, more manageable pieces. Even quantum mechanics is like that. And there's an assumption that the finer the granularity, the closer a solution comes to knowing reality. And the basic methodology in science consists of therefore gathering data and the assumption that any phenomenon can be broken down into information, measurement, and data collection. By the way, information is memory. So uh, as soon as I give you information, I love you, you have cancer, the stock market fell, and you've lost all your money, you're the most wonderful person I've met. So just that's information, or you perceive it as information, but I give that to you because of memory that immediately changes your metabolism. So uh, your metabolism must be at a quantum level. I remember once uh, telling a patient by mistake that he had cancer and I could see his metabolism changed instantly. And then a few minutes later, I said, I'm sorry, that was a mistake. That was somebody else and his metabolism changed instantly. So our metabolism is instantly influenced by information and information is a derivative of memory. So the problem with current science, of course, is that the primary state, primary state of reality is assumed to be physical and material. Matter first is the ontological primitive. And due to the failure of naive realism, now uh, advanced theories in physics are increasingly mathematical models without reference to collectible, collectible uh, empirical evidence. This is very important to understand that a lot of modern theories, string theory, multiverse, purely mathematical with no possibility of collectible empirical evidence. And because these theories are based on naive realism, which has many objections and I'll share with you a few of them. Furthermore, you know, if we really look at reality, uh, it's, uh, it's very difficult to reduce it to parts. Let me quote a few quantum physicists. Here is something from Erwin Schrodinger. Consciousness cannot be subdivided or reduced to component parts. This is Erwin Schrodinger. To divide or multiply consciousness is something meaningless. So consciousness uh, being immaterial has no granularity and indeed no dimensionality. Uh, 
In itself, consciousness contains no information, although the activity of consciousness produces experience, the level at which data, measurement, information actually begin. So matter first, as the ontological primitive, the physicalism uh, of science um, is unworkable. There's no point in which uh, time and space, uh, no point in time and space in which atoms and molecules learned to think. So ultimately consciousness is its own ontological primitive. I quote from Max Planck who said, I regard matter as derivative from consciousness. We cannot get behind consciousness. Also, think about this. Mathematics cannot model consciousness either through uh, complexity or abstraction because experience is untranslatable into equations. You can't put experience into equations. So once you examine the fundamental um, assumptions of science, you realize that naive realism is a good model for creating technology, but it's not really a model for exploring truth. The physical sciences are very successful in creating technology, but they cannot access fundamental reality because what we call matter is a name given to a species specific perceptual activity. We only observe our perceptions. I quote here, Sir John Eccles, who said, we are almost like magicians in that in the very act of perception, we take quantum soup and convert it into the experience of so-called material reality. The universe itself is an observed perception. There's no objective place to stand from, from where it can be proven to be real in the absence of observation. Matter itself is an assumption of naive realism, which quantum physics overturned more than a century ago. I quote Werner Heisenberg, who said, the atoms or elementary particles themselves are not real. They form a world of potentialities or possibilities rather than one of things. Here's another quote. Uh, we live in a participatory universe that responds not just to quantum measurement and the observer effect, but to human experience directly. Werner Heisenberg, what we observe is not nature itself, but nature exposed to our method of questioning. So being participatory, the universe or reality that we think is out there is seamlessly woven into human awareness. There is no subject object split. Um, like the probability waves of quantum mechanics, um, waves of quantum, uh, like the probability waves of quantum mechanics, subject and object exist in superposition until the instant of perception causes them to emerge simultaneously. In every observation, observer and observed emerge simultaneously. And finally, consciousness is whole, all enveloping and inconceivable, even though everything we conceive emerges from it. Max Planck, I'll quote him now. Science cannot solve the ultimate mystery of nature. And that is because in the last analysis, we ourselves are part of nature and therefore part of the mystery that we're trying to solve. So a lot of these questions are addressed in quantum body along with various exercises, reflections and meditations and insights into longevity, health span and healing. I hope you will uh, consider uh, reading the book, pre-ordering it and uh, sharing your views and your feedback with me. Thank you, my friends. Thank mm -hmm. you.